If you ask me, what's the most influential uh, NLP paper in recent three years? I'll probably tell you, it's Bird, which is the paper we are going to look into today. It's really a legendary paper. Um, even it was published two years ago, but now, even now. A lot of uh, uh, researchers still using Burr as a very uh, strong baseline, and it's still very, very, very relevant today. So you, you can see how uh, much influence it actually has. And this paper was published by Google AI. Really, really, really interesting paper. By the way, I make deep learning explained video every week. So if you would like to receive more relevant videos like this, uh, don't forget to subscribe. And your subscription is also my best encouragement to make more videos like this. And a little bit of the background. It actually published uh, two years ago and uh, you already got uh, 10,000 citations. Just 10,000 citations in two years, which is Remarkable, really, really, really incredible. Okay, a little bit of the background. Back then, uh, since the transformer transformer was first released, uh, which was twenty seventeen, there was a little bit like a competition between transformer architecture and uh, LSTM architecture. Uh, transformer is like consists of the feed neural network and the attention layers. So the Advantage of transformer is is very very parallelable, so you can really leverage the uh, GPUs. But the problem with that is you only can handle the fix fix uh, input exam fix fix length of input example, and language usually have a variety of uh, length. For example, sentence I can say very short and sentence I can say a lot of sentence a uh, very long sentence. As well, and on the contrary, LSTM just feels like it was built for natural language because it's process the languages, process the tokens recursively. Yeah, recurrently. So, uh, no matter how long your text is, is you just can handle because the nature of its uh, structure. So intuitively, I would really say LSTMs are the better choice for modeling language. But empirically, transformer just uh, perform better because uh, some reason. I think I think the main reason is because uh, it's very highly parallelable. So it just runs much faster than LSTMs based uh, model, especially when you scale up the the parameters in the model. They say if you want to chain a 1 billion, 10 billion parameter models, then uh, using LSTM uh, handling the long long sentences will just make it very slow. Okay, so enough background. Let's just officially introduce before Burr, pre Burr times, the dominant, the dominating architecture was LSTMs and Elmo, Elmo is also a language model. They use a lot of two layers of bidirectional LSTM to build and it achieves it achieved a lot of state of the art in NLP. And the, the architecture of that is the use the 1D convolutional neural network to handle the input tokens. So basically your input is a list of your the list of your characters in this world. So in this case I have a pen. They say we are Getting the input half, so your input will be H A V E. Then you would run the recurrent. Uh, sorry, you will run the CNN convolutional neural network to draw the conclusion of this word. So you will get a representation of this word, the word embedding of this word, and it's learnable. I just quickly go through, and then you have the representation of each token, the embedding for each tokens. Then you fill it into the uh, bidirectional STN. You have a four. LSTM 
background LSTN. After that, you concatenate these two uh, different directions LSTM together to form the representation of these tokens. And Elmo has two layers of this. So this is the uh, quick walkthrough of Elmer. It was super powerful when it was first released. It was also very, very sensational. And roughly eight months later, Burr also released, uh, Google also released their Burr. And Google that time was really, really pushing transformer architecture a lot because they basically, they basically invented transformer. But the problem is before they released Burr, they, don't, they didn't really have the good language models. They was built on top of transformer architecture. Then that's why Burr was born. So let's look into the bird. The bird uh, has certain sound advantages. The first advantage is it's deeply bidirectional. Uh, what I mean by that is in the Elmer architecture, you don't really model bidirectionally natively because you only model that through single direction LSTM. Then after you model the whole sequence, you concatenate the token. After you ha m model the whole, this whole sentence, I have a pen, then you concatenate the, the backward forward representation together to form the complete bidirectional representation of this. But it's really not native, not native because maybe let's say if you are modeling this uh, token, I have a pen. Then when you really model it, you use the forward LSTM, you only, when you process in the token uh, you only know these two tokens. You don't have the information of the pen at all. And if you are using the backward LSTM to model the token uh, you only have the t information of the token pen. You don't have these two tokens information at all. So it's not really native uh, in terms of bidirectionality. But the bird, bird used mask language modeling basically allow us to gain the fully bidirectionality, which I will cover later. And another is it's highly uh, parallelable. Yeah, if you really want to understand um, the basic of this, I have the uh, previous video I introduced transform architecture. I explained why it's highly parallelable. Uh, by the way, if you haven't watched the video, uh, my previous video tr about transformer architecture, and you are not really familiar with their architecture, I would highly recommend to go watch that first, then come back to this video because it's really, really important. I am not going to very detail the everything about transformer in this video because it, there will be too much. And I already explained a lot in the previous video, so feel free to check it out. And after that, come back. And the bird actually achieved uh, 11 NLP uh, state of the art, which is incredible. Yeah. The model architecture of bird is basically it uses the encoder part of transformer, just the encoder part, no decoder part. The encoder part of transformer is consists of uh, many transformer blocks, and uh, each block, each transformer block. Uh, encoder block, or you can get, say bird block, consists of a uh, fever neural network and a uh, uh, self-attention layer. Yeah, and I just assume you understand the transformer, so I'll just simply put it. It just use the encoder part of transformer. And this paper, they have trained two different sizes of the bird. One is called bird base, uh, which has 12th layer and uh, 760A hidden size, which means the hidden dimension uh, in the layers is 768 and the uh, 12 attention heads. In total, you have 110 million parameters. And the larger bird is 24 layers and the larger hidden dimension and definitely more attention heads. And he has, sorry, this is a typo. It's actually 300, uh, 334 million. It's around three times larger than bird based model. And uh, how, how, how does the model represent input and output? Uh, this is what we want to go through. And it actually uses the, the, the word piece embedding. So basically, normally when we do the language uh, 
natural language processing, we we do tokenization. We tokenize the sen sentence to a lot of different tokens. And the most straightforward way is you just use space to tokenize that. And definitely there's a lot of different ways. But in the in the Burr paper, they use word piece. Basically, uh, you can see they not only just break down the sentence to sub words, sorry, they not only just break down the sentence to words, they break it down to sub words, sub words. Um, or we can call it word pieces. For example, this is the input, input sentence. And they break it down to some, for some words, they break it down to sub words. Some words just uh, break it down to original words. For example, jet was break, broken down to J and the ET. That's from, for some reason, because this kind of word piece tokenizers, it learn the prefix, suffix of the uh, English words in this context, then uh, you will know ET actually shows up very frequently in English, so it becomes the one sub word. And like the, the word field also uh, was broken down to FE and the UD. And the rest of words are just the remain the same. And the reason word piece tokenizer uh, only broke these two words down into subwords. It's because of it learned from the corpus, the training corpus. Uh, they say maybe Wikipedia, English Wikipedia. And, and it learns that this ET and the F E U D uh, are very common in many many different words. So it decided to make it a subword, um, make them subwords. It's actually the data driven. So in in practice, if you want to train your own bird, then you may also want to uh, train your war piece tokenizer on your corpus uh, because every domain have different data distribution. So it's better to train your own war piece tokeni tokenizer unless you are also training on a very generic data like Wikipedia. Then you may just use a pre-trained one. Okay, so this is a word piece uh, embedding. And when you train training the word piece tokenizer, it's actually you need to predefine how many subwords, how many word pieces you, you want. Uh, so in, in this case, they, they, they pre-train this, they define uh, 30,000 word pieces is their target. So no matter what, no matter how much data you have, the tokenizer will learn uh, 300, 30,000 word pieces, and in the inference time, you will always uh, break any words to these uh, 30,000 word pieces uh, like this. The good thing is it can handle a lot of unseen words. Uh, for example, there are maybe new words they model have never seen in the training data, but you still can break it down to, like let's say we have the new word, uh, J-U-D, J-U-D, and JUD will be uh, broken down to J and the UD. And because w the model would have already, has already seen J and the UD, so it will still have the word piece embeddings for these two words. So J, UD will not be, will not be the un unknown word. Okay, but the problem is when you break the sentence down to sub words, it's usually longer than you just break, break a sentence to words. Because definitely one, one sentence can contain more subwords than words. So just make your sequence longer. And uh, the model will need to spend more time to process that. Also, the like, dependency between those subwords will become more complex. But in general, it's a really, really uh, optimal way to represent sentence text. Okay, so another one we need to pay attention is uh, spa spatial tokens. Spatial tokens is uh, quite spa quite spatial in the Burr architecture. So what they do was when they do the pre-training, they always put the classification tokens as a first token. Then uh, you put first a sentence and the second sentence, and you put a separator tokens between sentences, and also 
in the last uh, uh, position of your sequence, you always put a separator. Even you just have one sentence, like let's say you have just I have a pen as, a, as an input sequence input, then you still need to put a separator here. That's what I do in the pre-train. So the most important thing is usually you use burr. You use that to you you fine tune burr for your downstream task, and when you are fine tuning this, if you don't pull the classification tokens as your first tokens and the separator as your last token, then your model will have trouble. You will have the mismatch between pre-training and the fine tuning. And definitely, for most cases, if you can put these two, then you put that, then you will probably have better performance. But definitely, there are some cases you don't want to put classification token or separator, or you have enough downstream task data, then you you just you, you probably you say, oh, actually I want to remove that and the model can pick it up. Uh, because in the in the, the fine tuning, because I will have enough enough data, I model will figure out actually I don't I don't always put this classification. You you probably get what I mean. Because in the training model always like see the classification token. But in the fine tuning, if model didn't see that, the model will have some trouble. But if you have a lot of uh uh Fine tuning data, then they probably will not be the problem. And also, you can save one token. You can save some tokens. Yeah, because if, if you totally remove these three spatial tokens, then you will save uh, some computational power. So, really depends on situation. It's better to understand this. And how the model actually uh, combine the input. Uh, the input is like this, right? Uh, classification token, sentence one, separator token, sentence two, separator token. And this plain, this is means the plain, this word is uh, broken into two sub words, play and ing. Okay, so uh, you have token embedding, which is war piece embeddings here. And the segment uh, embedding, segment embedding basically is like to say, oh, is this part your first token if it's first uh, first sentence if this is your first sentence sentence embedding will be zero this input will be zero 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 and the sec second second sentence there will be one 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 just uh, to tell you which part is the first sentence which part is the second sentence and the position embedding is just uh, the position as your input but definitely after you p feed this into the model model will use the cosine and the sideways to represent the position embeddings here. And if you want to know more detail, uh, the transformer video is in the dis description below. Okay, so they kind of uh, do the addition to these two, three different embeddings to form the formal embeddings of this one word. So this is how they do that in the first layer, before the first layer, the embedding layers. Okay, so after going through, after we understand uh, the how they re the model represent uh, input tokens, then we're going to the main the main part of this paper, masked language modeling. This is probably the most innovative part of this paper because in the transformer, transformer doesn't have any concept of uh, masked language modeling. And uh, in the bird paper, in order to make the bird model, uh, make the transformer encoder pre-trainable and also have the bidirectionality, they come came up with the mask language modeling, which is to randomly mask fifteen percent of the input tokens. And uh, after you mask uh, certain number of the uh, tokens, then you put this as a training example in the pre-training time. So basically it's just doing pre-training with this. Then our uh, model will receive the context, right? Like this kind of a left context and the right context and use uh, that context to predict what should be the token, what should this mask token be? And the answer in for this is uh, pen, I have a pen. But definitely in the reality you will want to put a longer context because this definitely in this case you can put any kind of almost uh, any kind of noun to this like I have a duck do you have one 
I have a, a mug. Do you have one? So you want uh, your context to be longer to prevent this kind of uh, ambiguity. Okay, so the problem with uh, masked language modeling uh, is that when you're doing a pre-training, you have a 15% of tokens uh, are masked. But the, in the fine-tuning, you don't have any tokens got masked. Uh, the fine tuning means maybe you are doing sentiment analysis, so you input the the unmasked just the, the original sentence without any token got mask. Then the model read the sentence, read the sequence, and give the conclusion if this sentiment is negative, neutral, or uh, positive. So uh, this will create uh, just the mismatch discrepancy between uh, pre-training and the fine-tuning because in the fine-tuning you don't have any mask token so how they try to address this is I think this is very interesting and uh, usually got overlooked I think they mask only 80% of their token if a token is chosen let's say in this case this token is is uh, uh, I have a pen. The pen is is mask. It's chosen mask. And in the training time, you will only you only mask it eighty percent of the time. And the rest ten percent, you will just randomly replace uh, this to another token, a random token. And another ten percent, you will just remain the unchanged I token, which is put original token pen. Uh, by doing this, they can solve. Uh, they claim they can solve the 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 discrepancy between pre-training and the fine-tuning because in the pre-training time you still have twenty percent of time that you can see it. Uh, you, you still have ten percent of time you can see the original token, and uh, another ten percent you see the random token. But I think also a little bit weird because why why did you put a random token? That means in your objective function you will also encourage model to see to predict the random word here maybe I have a uh, I have a half I have a you I have a lay then there's really uh, grammatically incorrect sentence but model would still try to learn that even just 10% but maybe that's not a good idea so it's hard to say the the, 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 the better way to exper experiment this is try to do ablation test Try one time with this, try one time without using this. Try one time with just mask 100% and one time uh, using this strategy. Um, if you're um, curious about how to solve this problem, I think Electra, which is also invented, uh, published by Google uh, this year, uh, last year, I think, they try to address this problem. And a lot of papers actually try to, trying to address this problem um, two years later, right? Okay, so this is how they solve this. Um, another task, another chain, the first training objective is uh, mask language modeling to predict the mask tokens. And by the way, when, when, when you do the mask language modeling, you because you mask the token, then you mask the token and you will have, uh, the model will have the left context and the right context. Uh, which means model can natively access uh, by direction, by directional information. Doesn't like the auto regressive uh, language model. You only read from from left to right, or from right to left. You read all of them, both direction at the same time. Okay, so the, so the next uh, training objective is uh, next sentence prediction. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, they do this next sentence prediction because they want to increase the model uh, understanding of language. Or you can say, yes, it's just trying to increase model's uh, semantic uh, understanding of uh, your target language. So how, how do they do that? is uh, pretty straightforward in the corpus you have uh, sentence after sentence right so you just select your original sentence 
Uh, the sentence here is not necessary to be the sentence. The sentence here is just a term, terminology. They they can contain one sentence or two sentences. So when I say sentence, it actually means a sequence of text. Okay, so the next sentence means next sequence. They just random select next sequence, or the random 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 sequence from your corpus, and do the binary classification. So if this is next sentence or not. So let's say I have a pen. Do you have one? I want to borrow one. I want to borrow one. Is the next sequence. So if your you just put two sequence here. If your next sequence is uh, I want to borrow one, then it's a next sentence. If your next sequence is just random one, oh, I want I have a pen. Do you have one? This is first sequence. The second sequence, uh, I want to have breakfast now. And it's just a random. Sequence they extracted from your corpus, then it should be false. So it's just binary classifications. So when in the training time you have two loads, one loss function is a uh, uh, mask language modeling loss function. Another is a uh, um, next sentence prediction loss function. This is just the uh, uh, classification loss function, which is straightforward. And for language modeling, also just uh, you. Um, if you are not familiar with that, you can check out uh, like other language modeling papers, and you understand that. So for pre-train pre-training, uh, Bird the the starting point of Bird is because it's pre-trained uh, on a lot of text, then you it can be easily find him on a downstream task. So what data they use to pre-train? They use English Wikipedia, which have uh, which has which has uh, the two two thousand five hundred million words. And also books corpus, uh, eight hundred million words. And they portray on this. And the important important thing is, uh, these two corpus, they are all document level corpus. Uh, means you can extract the long, uh, continuous uh, sequence sequences from them, uh, because it, like I previously mentioned, it's important to fit the very long sequence, uh, as long as possible. I think. Uh, in your pre-training, because the model will learn better. If you just fit a very very short sentences, then model uh, will have a lot of uh, uncertainty, ambiguity. I have a pen. If you mask a pen, I can say I have an apple, right? I have a pen. I have a uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, PlayStation. Yeah, you, you can be anything. But if uh, the context, you, you give it more context, you will just reduce these kind of uh, possibilities, ambiguities. A little bit more details about how the mask language modeling works. When you mask one token here, it's actually a word piece, and you feed this in sequence to the model. The model will generate after the above transformer blocks, maybe let's say twelve layers. The model will generate a representation. Vector representation for each token. Then, if the model predict really really catch this work, then the hidden representation for these mask tokens will be really really close to its original token, which is pen. So when you pull the original token, I have a pen. Do you have one? This original sequence to the model. The model will generate also a representation for vectors for pen. And the vector to this mask token should be very close to the vector to the pen. So actually, after this hidden representation, they fit, uh, they fit this vector into a softmax, a uh, softmax over the vocabularies that you have. The model will predict which vocabulary it should be. Then, uh, if it's pen, it predicts pen, then it's correct. And the difference between this uh, uh, MLM mask language modeling and uh, the other auto regressive uh, language modeling is, in a MLM, you only uh, predict the mask tokens. You only calculate loss for mask tokens. And in the auto regressive, you you do it from left to right. Basically, you try to uh, predict every tokens. So that's the difference. Auto regressive was like 
you you have the content I have a uh, then you predict pen and in the next next sample you you have I have a pen and you try to predict do and by gradually doing this you will go through every single token in your sequence so that's a different that's a different that's a beauty of uh, mask language modeling you basically can uh only predict the mask tokens and also you can do a uh, uh, kind of uh, every prediction at the same time is parallelable because in auto regressive you need to do one by one before you predict the previous tokens you cannot predict the next and for the burr I think that's quite interesting how to implement that because you only <laughs> predict the, the, the mask tokens how you write the implement this in PyTorch or TensorFlow. That's interesting. If you are interested, you can uh, look up their code. Uh, probably can learn something. Okay, so that, that, let's just look into the benchmarking. Because they, they, they basically need to prove that Burr is super powerful. So they run, at that time they only have like glue test. Now we have glue test 2.0, but that time was the glue test one. Uh, which uh, consists of uh, many different uh, NLP tasks uh, like natural language inference, uh, natural language inference, sentiment classification, and so on. And uh, the, the Elmer plus uh, bidirectional LSTN on top of it and attention uh, on average achieve 71% uh, 71 uh, score, this average score. And uh, the Pre open AI state of the art, basically, I think there's a lot of different state of the arts. In not really sure it's one algorithm, but you combine that is 74%. And the open AI GPT 1 uh, achieves uh, 75 accuracy, which is the state of the art uh, before BERT. Then they have the BERT base model, which is amazing, 4.5%. Uh, higher than the previous state of the R. Then they increase the model size by three times. Then the Burr, Burr large model achieves 82% uh, uh, accuracy, which is incredible. It's 2.5% uh, over the Burr based model. So in here, when you increase the model size, the accuracy just uh, increased very, very drastically. So just to make people wonder, what if we increase the model size by three times more or 10 times more, and what will happen? So let's later on, a lot of people train uh, a lot larger language models, for example, uh, Megatron by NVIDIA, T5 uh, by, by Google, uh, which has 11 billion uh, parameters. They indeed improve the results a lot. And uh, just recently, uh, OpenAI GPT-3, which has 175 billion, and it achieved a lot, a lot of uh, state of the art. And for, for comparison, Burr Large only have uh, 0.3 billion parameters, which is much smaller. And they, in the OpenAI GPT-3 paper, they observed that the performance increase uh, over the model size is like the log. If you increase the model size uh, maybe uh, uh, 10 times, then your performance may be increased uh, like two times. Uh, sorry, it's like the increment is like the, the log function. So, so you just imagine the x axis is the model size and uh, the, the, the y axis is the performance. And if you look in the log scale, it will be like linear. So that, that's why I want to say. So it like means after you increase the model to a certain size, it's hard, very hard to uh, like increase it because increase the performance because you need to double, quadruple, t 10 times more the model size in order to gain a little bit performance. And now I'm not really sure we are like, um, we already hit a world or now 175 billion parameters maybe we we can try to push in one trillion in maybe next two years but what, what what's after that right this is like 
we already hit the, a lot of uh, lim computational limitation like more slow is slowing down okay so that's just a little bit side topic and of course uh, of course and of course they also ran this uh, Burr model on the squad data set. Uh, the squad data set is the question answering data set, like a machine reading task. Given a model, a ta uh, uh, an article, they mo ask a few questions related to the article. The model need to extract the answers from the article. And squad two point zero is a task. Uh, for some probability, some for some like percentage of the questions uh, don't have any answers. So the model also need to figure out if this question actually answerable. It's much harder than score 1.0. And as you can see, they easily achieve this state of the art uh, by quite a lot of margin. Uh, in the test accuracy, they just, uh, uh, the single model, they just, uh, you know, Upon the previously state of the art, uh, a lot. It's really a lot. It's like uh, five percent, six percent, and quite close to getting much closer to human performance. They also ran this on the um, squat one point one and also achieved the state of the art. So it's very impressive. They really tested this out on many different natural language processing tasks and proven that uh, the bird is just so good. Okay, then we're heading to the ablation studies because they basically employed so many different mechanisms to train a bird model. And what kind of mechanisms actually uh, contributed most? That's what we want to find out. So the first ablation task is the ablation over the pre-training task. So the baseline is bird based model with the mask language modeling and the next sentence prediction. And the second one is no next sentence prediction. And this one uh, left to right. So basically it's like the autoregressive ways like you do the autoregressive language modeling from left context then slowly uh, predict the, the next token and then the next token and the next token recursively and uh, without next sentence prediction so it's very comparable to GPT-1 GPT-2 GPT-3 as well but that time they only have I think GPT-1 and the last model is it's a left to right language modeling uh, without next sentence prediction plus a uh, bidirectional LSTM on top of it. Because if you just uh, use the auto regressive left to right language model, you will not really able to have the uh, future context, which means you only have one direction. Uh, you only have the, the context that's right before you, that's before you. So they put the bidirectional LSTN to make the model access the future content context. Okay, so uh, we are clear the diff we we are more clear for those definitions, and you can see if you remove the next sentence prediction in the pre-training, the model performance generally drops quite significantly. Uh, I would not really say significantly. It's like 0.5 percent here, and here is in this task. Uh, natural language inference, it, Q natural language inference is dropped a lot, but the rest of them actually not that much. In fact, uh, a year later, I think there uh, was another paper called Roberta published by Facebook AI, and they figure out actually next sentence prediction is not really important, and removing that actually improved the model performance. If you're interested, in, just uh, search Roberta natural language processing then you can see the paper uh, oh, actually I will put it in the description down below you can check out the paper very interesting they discuss uh, the importance of next sentence prediction and also there are a lot of uh, different modification or on the next sentence prediction task uh, 
in the recent two years. There's so so many things that we can improve, at least for this next sentence prediction. Okay, so uh, another one, uh, left to right context without next sentence prediction, it basically drops more performance. The performance drops uh, very drastically because you only have left to right context. Uh, that's foreseeable, especially for those uh, inference uh, intense uh, tasks. If you only have the the context, the context that happen before you, then you will not really be able to uh, predict the thing very well. But definitely, depend, depending on how you fill the data. But that's only for downstream task. In the pre-training time, you also uh, kind of uh, have uh, less information during training or pre-training. So we can uh, infer that the priority model is less well trained. And if you plug in uh, bidirectional STN when doing a downstream task, uh, when doing a, a fine tuning on downstream tasks, you basically uh, have a very similar performance, but for a squat, uh, which is a t which is a task really, really, really require a future context, uh, improve quite a lot. But all in all, the bird the standard bird still like outperform all these variations. Um, they just uh, at least in this experiment, it tells us that uh, all the uh, mechanisms, mask language modeling and the next sentence predictions, are very important. Okay, the next is ablation over model size. Uh, as you can see, they started from three layers and uh, go all the way up to 24 layers and the attention head also like increase accordingly uh, roughly and hidden size also like change a little bit and uh, the phenomena is very uh, pronounced you can see like when you increase the model size uh, the performance of language model in the perplexity just reduce uh, accordingly and uh, the the other accuracies uh, on different tasks also increase, increase, increase. Uh, it's very like strict, strictly increase. So model size uh, really, really, it's really, really important means they basically train on the same pre-training data. They just tells us that the model uh, size can be larger, still can be larger because the data we have way too much data than the model parameters. So uh, we should, if the uh, limitations uh, is not a problem, we should scale the model more, maybe 10 times more, 100 times more. So that's why we have GPT-3. And I believe GPT-3 is not just, uh, uh, it's not a ending, there will be still much, many more uh, larger language models uh, will be produced in the future. Okay, another ablation task, it's not ablation task, now this one is experiment test, experiment. Uh, so basically uh, they want to compare these to Elmer. Elmer is more like a few feature based approach. What, what, what does feature feature-based approach, it basically means you don't really fine-tune the language model. You use language model to generate the text representation. Then you feed those text representations into the downstream task models. So let's say you want to do the um, sentiment analysis. Then the, the, the conventional way to use spur model is you, you Put one prediction layer on top of on top of bur. Then you fine tune. You do the end to end fine tune. You fine tune all the parameters in the bur. So this is what we call a uh, representation based model. At least this is what this paper calls that. And the feature based means we use bur model to generate a feature of uh, every token. So you will get one vector to one token in your text, your sequence that you want to classify. Then you fit this uh, 
a list of vectors to your model, whatever model you want to use. You want to use LSTM, you want to use uh, CRF, and whatever model, then you feed that to your downstream task model. So in the training, in the downstream task, task training, you never train a bird, you never fine tune a bird. So this is what we call feature-based approach with bird. And I want to compare with Elmer and the some other uh, approaches. So as you can see, uh, the fine-tuning approach uh, definitely got the best result because you're finding all the parameters. And the feature base, they are a little bit tricky because you have so many ways to kind of represent this feature, right? And uh, embeddings uh, basically means that in the Burr model, uh, transform, architecture, transform architecture, you have embedding, world piece embeddings. Uh, in the first before the first layers, and they use that, those embeddings as a feature to present your text, and you got a uh, definitely not as good the results ninety one percent F one score for for the NER task. This is a uh, NER uh, CO LL. I forgot the name. Uh, Two thousand three is the most famous NER task, and uh, yeah, I forgot to put a name here for. But anyways, of an NER task, then um, if you p extract the second to last last hidden layers of the bird model as the feature, then you can have ninety five percent front score in the uh, validation data set. If you extract the last hidden layer, you got worse result. And what really interests me is if you can concatenate the last four hidden layers, which means the, the uh, ninth layer, 10th layer, 11th layer, and the 12th layers. You extract all their hidden layers, uh, and you concatenate all of them, uh, which means the, each of them has the 768 dimensional vectors. Then you concatenate all the vectors, so you will get 768 times four dimensional vector to represent one vector. And definitely the, after that, you will have a list of vectors. How how you deal with that in your uh, task specific model, it depends on you. And they put the LSTN on top of it. But anyway, they train like this way, then uh, the concatenate uh, last four layer, last four hidden layers achieve the best result. Basically, it's getting closer to the fine-tuning approach. So it just tells us that the feature base is also not really bad if you know how to concatenate that, if you know how to represent a feature. And the good thing for feature base, why, why, why do people want to use feature, feature base? Because, because feature base basically is not even, in terms of training, it's not faster than the fine-tuning. Fine-tuning is also very efficient. The good thing of feature base is like you can do the pre-calculate for the, your features. Then, after, because you have the fixed of, fixed set of training data, right? Then you use your bird language model to calculate those features. Then you store that somewhere, and after you don't need to calculate it again, then you randomly you can just. Uh, arbitrarily select a lot of downstream tasks task models. Uh, then use those uh, pre-calculate features to find figure out what ta what is the base downstream model that you can potentially use. That, that's the advantage of feature base. But to be honest, in the modern NLP world, uh, I think more people go with the fine-tuning approach because it's tons of implementation. Uh, it's just the con conceptually simple. Okay, anyway, that's the end of this presentation. And I hope this video can help you understand Bird a little bit uh, more. I don't think that you can un fully understand Bird just with this video. That's a gradual process. You need to use it. You need to, when you use it, you have some question um, in terms of how it works. Then come back to this video or go back to the original paper or there are a lot of resources online just gradually gain some understanding and go back to use it 
and get some understanding. Eventually, you understand it a lot. And most important thing is transformer architecture. I will just recommend, highly recommend you to figure that out. Once you understand the transformer architecture fully, understand every single math in the transformer, then you will be uh, doing more than fine. Uh, okay, so yeah. If you enjoyed the video, give it a like and don't forget to subscribe for more relevant deep learning videos like this. And other than that, take care. Until next time.